Now, Canada is lit and please be prepared for the swiftness of the air that's being pushed out by the snow sub right about now. Now, have you ever wondered how much power the Sono Sub Mini is rated for? Or even the larger Sono Sub Gen 3? Have you tried searching on the internet and turn out blank? Well, that's because Sonos doesn't publish these numbers. Now, if you like the sound and the amount of bass coming out from them and it already satisfy you, there's really no need to know the power draw of these subs. But aren't you curious? And Sono says that the Sono Sub Mini also hits as low as 25 hertz, which is the same as the Sub Gen 3. Now, does it actually hit 25 hertz? Let's find out. Now, in my videos, I give you upfront summaries so you don't have time to stay throughout the whole video. You don't have to. I respect your time that way. Now, not only the Sub Mini hits 25 hertz, it actually draws more power playing 25 hertz than the Sub Gen 3. But that doesn't mean that it actually plays 25 hertz better and louder than the Sub Gen 3 or the Sub Gen 2. Power draw is just one side of the equation. The efficiency of the amplifier and the driver used needs to be considered too. But the peak power draw from the Sub Mini is about 180 watts, whereas the Sub Gen 3 will top out at about 260 watts. The highest power draw of 180 watts from the wall with a sub mini is actually at 25 hertz. So how did I do the testing? What is the testing methodology? I used a tone generator to play back sine waves generating frequencies all the way from 20 hertz to 120 hertz or 150 hertz in 5 hertz increment. I then used a power meter measuring the power draw from the wall. Now, this is hardly scientific and these aren't the most accurate measurement tools and it definitely doesn't take into account efficiency. Now, remember that an American muscle car from the 80s with a 4-litre V8 engine can guzzle a lot of fuel. But that doesn't mean it's going any faster than a modern efficient car like the Audi Q5 with a 2.0 turbo engine. Now, whatever the readings say, the regular size Sono Sub was definitely unbearably loud as compared to the Sub Mini when I was doing the testing. Now, if you really need more bass and more power, the bigger Sub is definitely going to give you more of that. Now, let me get into a little bit more details after I give you the upfront summary. Now, first, let me tell you how I actually did the testing. Now, I ran two test scenarios. The first test scenario was a Sub Mini with a Beam Gen 2 configuration versus a Sub Gen 3 with a Sonos Arc configuration. I then played the series of frequencies from 20 Hz all the way to 120 Hz. And then I realized that the Beam and the Arc will set the crossover points for the Sub differently. So it wasn't a fair comparison. The only way to test this properly was to pair both Subs, the Mini and the Gen 3, together to the same soundbar. But I realized that that actually won't work very well either because you can't control the crossover point for the soundbars. Not to mention that the larger sub might actually be suffering still from some issues with the bass output, although I didn't actually have true play turned on. So I tried scenario number two, which is where I use a Sonos M. This, okay, I won't pull it out from there. And uh, in the Sonos M, you're actually able to set the crossover point to the sub that is paired together with it because you might be using a variety of speakers. I have a small speaker somewhere hidden behind those subs. Um, and if the speaker is big, you want to set the crossover point uh, to pretty low because the bigger speakers will be able to generate more lower frequencies. If the speakers are small, you set the crossover frequency to a lot higher because the small speakers won't be able to generate that much bass. So it hands over more of the duties and crosses it over to the subs higher point. So in this test, I paired the Sub Mini and a Sub Gen 2. That's the Sub Gen 2 actually, together with the Sonos M and I set the crossover point all the way to 110 hertz, which is the highest available. And it means that I will hand over almost all the bass notes to the subwoofers that is attached to the M. Now, this is the entire chart of the power draw of the Sonos Sub Mini and the Sub Gen 3 when it's paired with the Sonos Arc. And this is the entire chart of the power draw of both subs when paired with the Sonos M. Now, in the case of the Sonos M, you can see that the crossover is set higher than the Sonos Arc, actually. So it allows for a lot more bass frequencies to be passed over to the Sonos Sub, thus 
allowing a higher power draw. But in the case of the Sonos Arc, the Sub Mini is actually um, capable of producing more bass frequencies, channels more of the power that the Sub Mini is capable of producing, and at a peak of 180 watts at 25 hertz. Now, this is as contrasted to the Sub Mini drawing 166 watts at 25 hertz when it's paired to the Sonos M. I would say that this is still within a margin of error because the equipment test, uh, the test equipments are just not as precise as I want them to be. So, when paired to the Sonos M, both subs are now allowed to play up to their max power at all available frequencies. Now, in the case of the larger sub, it is actually played at 110 hertz with a peak power draw of 200. And 60 watts. Now, at this point of the testing, I started to smell something weird, like something is burning, you know. And I really don't recommend any of you to try this with your larger sub because the limits of the motors inside driving the, the cones are likely to be close to breaching points. So, let me just do the testing and you get the results at my risk, right? Now, you'll tell that the Sub Gen 3 is actually drawing two peak power points at both 50 Hz and 110 Hz, which is very different from the Sub Mini pulling out two peak power draws at 25 Hz and 100 Hz. At the higher bands of the subwoofer frequencies, both subs are getting about the same peaks there, 100 Hz, 110 Hz, with the Sub Mini drawing less power. But at the lower end of the base spectrum, it is evident that the Sub Mini is actually pulling a lot more power there. Now, does this actually translate to higher base output at the respective base frequencies? No, not really. Now, you remember my analogy of the American muscle car versus the modern, efficient turbocharged engines deployed in the Volkswagen Audi group of vehicles? Yep, that is where this analogy will come to life. Now, you take a look at the matching frequencies actually being played by the subs. Let me show you the frequency response charts. Now, in both measurements, the full range speakers attached are being removed from the Sonos M. So, there is no output from the speakers that are messing with the sub output frequencies. Only the subwoofers are attached and only sound coming out is from the subwoofer. And even when the sub mini is pulling more power at 25 hertz, the bass output at 25 hertz remain lower than the sub gen 3. Now, this actually means that the sub gen 3 is more efficient at 25 hertz. But the question is, can the Sub Mini play at 25 hertz? Yes, it can. It is not a matter of whether it can play at 25 hertz. It is a matter of whether you can hear it or not. Now, if there's still a shred of doubt that the Sub Mini can play at 25 hertz, this is a live candle demonstration that I'm going to show you. Now, subwoofers make a lot of bass by pushing lots of air. The Sub Mini may not be pushing a whole lot of air, but it is still pushing air. The Sub Mini is also a sealed design, so there's no port where the air is being pushed out. But in this demo, where I actually play a 25 hertz test tone, you can actually see the air being pushed out, tickling the flame on the candle. Now, when I play a 50 hertz tone, you can see that there is still airflow over the candle. So, what about the ported design of the larger subwoofer? A port in a subwoofer allows for air to move more freely when the cone moves. Right? A ported subwoofer produces hard-hitting bass by leveraging on that. But you need a slightly more powerful end with higher damping factor to move and stop the cone as there is no sealed pocket of air to dampen the cone. Now, let's take a look at how much more air is being pushed out by the Sub Gen 3 subwoofer when a 50 Hz tone is being played. Now remember, at 50 Hz, the Sub Gen 3 is drawing in excess of 250 watts from the wall, close to the peak. Now candle is lit and please be prepared for the swiftness of the air that is being pushed out by the Sun Sub right about now. So you can see that the Sub Gen 3 is definitely the much more powerful subwoofer and is capable of producing a lot more bass depending on the product that is being paired with. Now, the room where the testing is um, uh, conducted is fairly small, so the bass extension is definitely not a limitation of the room. But given that the smaller Sub Mini is just half the volume and the size of the larger Sub, why is it that it's able to produce such deep bass? In fact, Sodos also advertises the Sub Mini to reach as low as 25 Hz. So how does it produce close to 80% of the bass that the regular Sub uh, is capable of producing with just half the cabinet size and less power? Now, in subwoofer design or speaker designs in general, the common perception is that the bigger the movement of the cone, the louder and better the speaker will sound. Louder, usually. And, well, it's an accurate statement, but that's only half the whole truth. 
to produce accurate sound, the cone not only has to start moving, it also has to stop moving when it's supposed to stop. Now, in a sealed enclosure, the air inside it acts like a limiting cushion to help control the movement of the cone of the woofer, right? So it allows the subwoofer, the cone, to stop readily when the bass note stops. Now, this allows for a much more accurate bass note, even when more power is applied to it at lower frequencies, because the cone can now stop readily and not cause the bass to bloat beyond the intended note. So sealed design actually works well for a smaller enclosure. If the enclosure is too big, the larger volume of air would mean that the cushioning effect of the sealed design is lessened. Thus, it won't be able to control the movement of the cone that well. And because the enclosure is smaller, the amp is naturally going to be smaller and less powerful. And in the case where there is less amplification power, you will need a sealed design to get the pocket of air to help control the cone movement thus producing accurate bass notes at lower frequencies, even with less power. The Sub Mini is not just a simple miniaturization of the popular Sub that Sonos has produced for the last decade. It's a piece of sweet engineering that produces bass that bellies the size of the subwoofer. Yeah, you definitely won't be getting as much bass as the Sub Gen 3, the bigger Sub, but if you don't need the power and the amount of bass that the Sub Gen 3 is pushing out anyway, you are actually getting quite close to that amount of bass at half the price and half the size. So if you are still keen to learn more about the Sono Sub Gen 3 and need more information to help you decide between the two, maybe check out this video right here where I describe all the differences where I talk about the improvements made to the Sub Gen 3 over the Sub Gen 2. And maybe if I've already made a new video to help you evaluate all the factors to make your decision easier between the Sub Mini and the regular size Sub, I will link that video right here as well. So I will see you over in that video.